Thank you. Here we are again for the promised extended interview with Riaz. Uh, we're at the Nairox Culture Fair where Riaz is a uh, uh, new installation, uh, Fourth World, which is uh, two statues of Ambedkar pointing east and west uh, amidst four plinths of different, different heights. has just been installed today and has been inaugurated as part of the Sculpture Fair. So here uh, in this section I just want to interview Riaz about a uh, whole set of other questions, more uh, broadly related to his practice, his life, and his uh, life as an artist in India right now. And India, an idea of India which is under considerable siege right now. And it's a moment into which Riaz speaks very convincingly, forcefully, and passionately. So I'll begin by asking uh, Riaz about the painting of Ambedkar just behind him, which he did on a previous visit to uh, Johannesburg at the invitation of the Center for Indian Studies in Africa. This was last year in 2018 and he's back in 2019 to complete the installation of the two statues. So Riaz, uh, can you tell us something about this painting that you did at the Cradle of Humankind where we are located right now? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, you know, the invitation uh, which I received, I think I I see it as a, uh, a great uh, blessing because uh, it was almost around the same time I was working uh, on my solo show called Holy Shiva in, in Delhi. Uh, uh, <coughs> so, and that was a project which looked at uh, what is India today. You know? So it's mainly looking at a uh, discourse on Gandhi and uh, you know, the possible uh, you know, discourses which one could trigger around the ideas of Ambedkar and also the Indian constitution and what is happening in the context of uh, uh, you know, violence against the, the minorities and uh, the displaced. So I also addressed you know, the, the, a little bit of a historic narrative of violences which happened in India and also lynching in recent years. So, I think coming here, you know, from the thick of many other things which I was doing was uh, almost like a blessing because this is a place, uh, it's a cradle of humankind, it's one of the biggest sculpture parks uh, in the world and, uh, you know, total silence and I was actually, uh, you know, back into a place that you know, where there was nobody, you know, uh, Except I mean, you know, some evenings, I mean, I was the only person living here in this big park. So, and for me, I mean, it was after many years, it was a time for contemplation. And, you know, so, uh, post that uh, Holy Shiva exhibition, the kind of discourses which happened, and you know, some of the comments, and I was actually taking it as a site to kind of sit and think. And I immediately felt that I mean, this has got a power, I mean, you know, there's a site of thinking kind of thing. So, I think. Uh, the main, main thinking which revolved around what some of uh, you know key points which Ambedkar kept arguing about the human struggle and uh, the ongoing struggle and he compared comparing it with the kind of a it's an historic uh, or you know not historic I mean, it's a it's a generational issue I mean it's been happening to many generations I mean the similar issue which he is fighting for. So I thought, I mean, it was a very interesting site to kind of think and study him and you know, understand. So I kept reading, you know, about uh, you know, some of his ideas. And so it was almost like, I mean, you know, it was not a painting. I mean, it was almost like, I mean, you know, uh, you know, kind of writing a diary here. You know, so I just, you know, went to, uh, you know, I just decided to kind of to paint this very angry looking, you know, young, uh, very argumentative Ambedkar, I mean, which he is very famous for, I mean, even still today. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, actually, I wanted to ask you a set of questions which actually takes us before this exhibition and to uh, introduce the viewer to something of who you are in your practice. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'd like to like you to talk a bit about your growing up in Kerala. And very often for a lot of people, the idea is that Kerala is a largely cosmopolitan society where issues of caste 
have been fought against and resolved to a large extent. It's a state where uh, there 60% Hindus, 20% Muslims, 20% Christians. We also have a significant Jewish minority. Uh, how much of all of this goes into your thinking, your practice, your building, as it were? You know, what makes you the artist that you are? Yeah, I think it's a, an important, uh, uh, you know, point. I mean, you know, when you consider, you know, individuals. I mean, you know, what is their background? I mean, where they come from. So, in my case, I think uh, I owe a lot. Uh, to, to my family, I mean, you know, my uh, state, uh, my surroundings, and you know, my neighbors, because I actually had a very, very interesting you know, political or you know, social upbringing, and which was very, you know, inclusive in every sense. And and uh, my family was, you know, my father especially lived a very strong socialist lenient life. I mean, he was very many his brothers were very much involved in communist, you know, movements and uh, he was also in the initial years. But uh, he was somebody who was, he was an entrepreneur. I mean, he had a matchbox factory and he had, you know, more than 100 people working in his factory. So he was very much committed to the to employees and, you know, also the family, you know, I have 10 siblings. So I come on a nine son. So he was very, he was somebody I mean, who I started seeing as a very responsible person. So at the same time, he was the first person who kind of uh, put a seed in me that whatever you do, I mean, do it for you know for the benefit of the people and community. I mean, that if you divert from there, you know, don't move into anything. I mean, whether it's a business or whether it's art or you know, like literature or cinema or music. So he, he had. He felt that, I mean, I have a lineage towards art, I mean, from the early years, because I was drawn into that. But his message was always, uh, you know, his message was always interesting that, you know, people first, you know, so that, and he proved it, I mean, you know, he was doing that in front of us, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you know, so, and that's something, the energy which I still carry with me. So, when I went to study, in art, uh, in Jesus School of Art, I and mean, you know, he said that, you know, maybe it's, you know, uh, you know, you're going to manage but because I went to study textile design to Bombay, you know, I was not going to kind of study art because my brother, name is Ibrahim, uh, who actually found there is certain kind of an interest, inclination in me towards art and design. So he told me to kind of, you know, because of my taste and choice, he said, textile design is very good for you, go for it. That's how I leave, like many Malayalis who opt to leave to Middle East. I have my six brothers who lived in Middle East, I mean, in Dubai and, you know, Saudi Arabia and Sharjah and other places. So there's always that, you know, the Malayali leaving the place to find job and, you know, to seeking for a, a better life. But I always told my father, I mean, I'd never go to Gulf. But I was much more interested in putting my learning and because I looked at Kerala through his eyes because he is somebody who, who was a very strong follower of socialist ideas. He was very Gandhian in his approaches. At the same time, he was also a follower of his religion. I mean, he did five times namaz. And so he was a kind of very you know, symbolic of like, I mean, how to live in a social space like this. You know, so and and he had everything in in, in right space. So I didn't have to kind of look at you know uh, art icons to kind of relate my art with people. So that was very. So I would say that uh, my uh, upbringing in Kerala. Has, I would say that I mean, you know, my upbringing in Kerala has you know contributed many in many levels from from uh, you know the, from the history of social action or political action which you've seen around from from my own family you know my how my father dealt you know his uh, you know business and you know this larger family which he was like a hugely responsible then how very easily he let his children go out mm -hmm. and uh, because 10 children I mean, you know I don't think he saw anybody and all of them together after a point of life. 
because everybody was out, you know, somewhere or the other. So I think, uh, yeah, I think Kerala is kind of, you know, Kerala's, uh, living in Kerala is very infectious also, you know, like, I mean, you get affected by everything because you're always, you know, engaged with, you know, the social space, politics, global politics. Because I still remember telling my friends in Bombay whenever they kept asking about Kerala, Kerala. Because they were, you know, the moment they don't, they, I tell you that I am from Kerala, the few things which they ask is that very classic things, you know, like, I mean, high literacy, politically conscious, you know, beautiful state, God's own country, all those things comes in. But because they started seeing certain kind of politics in me in my initial years, so I used to tell them, like, I mean, fifth standard when I went to high school, which was like five kilometers away from my you know, house, you know, or I think the 10th or you know, the 12th day of the first uh, fifth standard schooling, I went back home by 11 o'clock. So my mom asked, I mean, you know, what is it? So the reason was that, I mean, there was a strike, which in solidarity with the Palestinians. <laughs> so that's the upbringing you have. I mean, so it just comes to you this kind of political consciousness and about the global yeah. you know, context which you are supposed to live with. So I think living in Kerala, living as a Malayali is that, I mean, you, know, you learn automatically or, you know, it's not, I don't think it's a university. I always feel that, I mean, it's a good teacher. Right. <laughs> it's a, you know, you need to have a you know, good teacher, you know, to, to teach us about you know, kind of uh, greater understandings. The similar experience, you know, I actually went into kind of a similar experience in Bombay. Okay, that's what I want to ask you a bit about because one of the things about, as you point out, growing up in Kerala, there's a certain broadness of vision that one gets used to, certain histories yeah. of struggle against inequality, against forms of irrationalism, forms of superstition. There's also a sense uh, of uh, growing up as not so much as a Hindu and a Muslim, like as you say with your father, somebody who uh, prayed five times a day but was a communist and was committed to a larger vision of what society should be. But when you move to a city like Bombay, which has other histories of relation be between Hindus and Muslims, and I know you were there in the period 1992 and 1993 when a huge fault line was opened up in Indian society as a result of Hindu nationalist discourse, what did it mean for you, and this is a slightly personal question, what did it mean for you as a Muslim? Because I suppose at some level you do see yourself as a Muslim as well, amidst your artistic practice and your much broader secular sensibility. Yeah, I think, uh, see what I, you know, carried with me from Kerala, you know, the idea of you know, living in any social space, which has helped me a lot to understand, you know, the way things changed, especially in a city like Bombay, you know, uh, around religious, you know, discriminative approaches, I mean, you know, the attacks against the minorities. So I think that's where, you know, your understanding and, you know, your, you know, your ability to kind of negotiate uh, plays a big role. I was, I became more conscious about my religion after going to Bombay because it, I went to Bombay in early '92. Then <laughs> late very 92, crucial point. Yes. In late '92, things start changing. You know, so I was also staying in a place that where I was very close to one of the, the, the most important political leaders, like Balasaheb Thakre. Hostel was next to him, so it was always there is some kind of a camera there, you know, like I mean, you know, to kind of take a note of what is next, you know. So on the right hand side that I have, you know, a legend growing, you know, Sachin Tendulkar, the next building. So I was actually like a bit sandwiched between these two, you know, interesting, you know, uh, uh, items of, you know, uh, especially right. in Bombay at that time. So. I actually, you know, I was the only Muslim in the hostel. I mean, there were many, many, many students from different parts of India and also from outside India and mainly from Maharashtra, from the rural Maharashtra. So I think it was not difficult for me to kind of, you know, to, to, to live very silently 
without even thinking about you know my you know religious uh, identity maybe uh, you know my father has helped me a lot in you know understanding that complexity of india what it is then only later when later you start your practice you started looking at you know different political icons you study so like i said that the kerala if kerala can be a very good teacher i think bombay was you know was my post graduate teacher I mean, it's like you know, a little bit more you know that where bombay was giving me higher studies in that sense I mean, so it's it is its effect on you the cosmopolitan nature of the city the 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 way it you know affects you the, the, the travel in trains and the fear see if bombay was the first city which gave me the symptoms of social fear where you are not supposed to talk about the person who is ruling you you know that's my first 92 onwards i started experiencing that aspect that i mean so when i see when i when i see the fear in indian society today yes which is a very cultivated you know uh, you know very programmed uh, thing i s- think back and you know that because in a train you can't talk politics you know in a public space you can't talk politics in a tea shop you can't talk politics and uh, that had, you know that was my bombay you know like my initial years of bombay so and the college was a political i mean you know the jesus school of art was had nothing to do with politics even i saw jesus school of art as an institution historically known for abstract but i started seeing shift in the language of art making post 92 93 94 it started slowly changing some of the major indian political artists you know triggered a different kind of uh, discourse through very interesting exhibitions which was traveled into bombay i see yeah, i think uh, yeah my bombay early bombay years are like something which i still sit back and think I suppose it tended to bring together your life, your politics, and art in a way that probably you didn't want it to. It was that there's a way in which history uh, impinges on you in India. Right? I mean, because certainly for a lot of us, there've been various watersheds, and that series that you did for uh, Holy Shiva, your exhibition, which takes up 1947. 1984 1992 2002 2016 and when these events happened in 1992 we we were all woken up and we thought well here we are uh, at an instant conjuncture in history which we hope won't happen again forgetting that just 8 years before with the assassination of mrs gandhi there had been an violence unleashed on a minority and it happened again in 2002 in gujarat so there is a way in which one can't actually be in india and not have history sitting on your shoulder all the time and i suppose you, a lot of your artistic practice in bombay uh, reflects that but there's another question that i wanted to ask you about you know when there is we are at a moment in some sense where we are troubled a lot of people are beginning to despair and when one thinks back to somebody like ambedkar right ambedkar was very convinced of both the need for and the possible impossibility to fund could use a phrase like that the possible impossibility of maitri or friendship right so what does art do in a circumstance like this and this is where i want you to think forward to uh, the idea of the biennale which you helped start along with bose krishnamachari in 2012 a very difficult struggle but that we'll get to later but how does art an artistic practice at a particular conjuncture in history allow us to address this politics of a possible friendship a possible enmity between people of maitri bringing maitri back Yeah, I think uh, my uh, stay in the hostel, uh, J.J. School of Art Hostel in Kalanagar, which is around 30 minutes away uh, from uh, the college, uh, 
it was an interesting site where you know different uh, plus artistic traditions came to study in the school of art and the hostel was their resort and it was fully subsidized and it was like almost like living in, in a free space with very subsidized food and it was a great learning space for me. It was my first living in hostels after living in my home in Kerala. Uh, I had almost all my room partners come from a very Dalit Maharashtrian background and very interesting stories I encountered on, on a regular basis with them. Their stories from their villages. So one of my, you know, who partner who was almost for three years continuously was a young artist who was struggling to practice now, is Rahul Vajale. So his father was a school teacher. So he, every time, you know, he, you know, he, evenings are like you know, very interesting discussions. Like and one day he was telling me that after coming back from village, my, about this. You know, father's experience. Father, being a school teacher, he was doing census, national census. So he was telling me that this father is doing the census in his village, and most of the houses his father is not allowed to enter. He has to stand outside the gate with the with the record book and ask. Yeah, there the call call, and they say. So it was just almost like, I mean, you know, though I heard this still exist in, in places in Maharashtra, but these are the kind of first-hand experiences, like, and I'm hearing in, I'm talking about 94, 95, in which we have heard about Kerala, I mean, maybe, you know, seven years ago, or a hundred years ago. But, so this, see, I don't think, I mean, you know, I grew up with that, that, that kind of extremity in Kerala, because I, okay, I remember I'm walking back from my school to my home, there is an area that where there are temples and other things, so if we ask for water, I have experienced, you know, they will keep water on a particular, you know, stone, and they will take that, but we never thought that, I mean, it is because of caste or anything, but we have experienced it, but coming to Bombay, consistently hearing stories like this and reading, you know, poetries uh, of, you know, uh, Maharashtra Marathi writers, you know, reading even Tukaram, for instance, and uh, listening to this Dalit politics, which is much more sharper and contextual in a state like Maharashtra. I think it's uh, I always used to feel that, I mean, you know, unlike Kerala, that where Ambedkar was not, you know, a part of a social discourse, I mean, when we were growing up, it was my first striking point was that Ambedkar, you know, where I always see him in, around, you know, in, in, if you just walk into a gully, you see, you know, Ambedkar has been celebrated, there are statues, and, you know, his photograph has been like, I mean, he's been considered as a god. So, I think that has played, uh, but I never looked at, you know, politically, because always when you touch upon those kind of subjects, people target you as, or you know, consider you as an cliched approach of art making and other things, so I just kept myself away. But there was this feeling in you that, I mean, you know, this social discrimination, and which you're seeing, or which you've heard, you're experiencing in Maharashtra on a, on a, on a, on a regular basis. And so, but it, it happened with me very late, when in recent years, that when you started seeing an enmity growing into, you know, the game which one is using to kind of, uh, to, to, to accumulate power. You know, so that's when then you see that I mean, you know, there is uh, this enmity growing. I mean, there's no possibility of like I'm talking about friendship. Mm -hmm. This constant enmity growing in the social space. That's where you know I think that this man has come back into the you know, into the into the discourse. But going back to another parallel journey which I was having in relationship with my work from '92 onwards, I started responding to 
social political issues. But when I did my first exhibition in in uh, Bombay, the exhibition was titled Unconditional. Because I always used to think that I mean, you know, I grew up in a place like Kerala where we always lived very argumentatively. You know, that's your spirit of living. You, know, you question everything. You know, you discuss everything. You debate, and you know, that's your lifestyle. But you come to Bombay, you start seeing that people are living unconditionally. In fact, I titled my exhibition Unconditional. And most of the works revolved around that. Then, moving further, in a similar idea, because I always wanted to kind of look at creating a discourse or an art which can connect to people, which can talk about people, which also talks about the idea of you know, diversity, coexistence, multiculturalism, but thinking that my initial years of you know, even diverting myself into art started with this, the big you know, issue happened in 92. Mm -hmm. Because you always thought that I mean, now maybe you, know, you should always think about like, I mean, having a friendship. You know, having the, that Sahodhya which you always talk about, okay. you know, there should be another, you know, possible, so maybe that is my, you know, uh, that should be my approach. I took it as a very strong political decision. So that's why, you know, there's a, my art was becoming political in, in those, adopting right. those terminologies. But according to me, it was nothing political about it. It was, you know, the reason okay. to move further. I mean, there's not, no other way of like I mean, making art according to me. Then you do Faith Akambli, that in 2004. Right. Again, with a very assertive, you know, uh, I mean, I, I was actually in implicating the religion as a culprit. Because, you know, that's, because I started seeing that shift happening. Because, because of my contrast, I started seeing that, I mean, you know, that it's, we have become so religious. Yeah, I wanted to address that. And 2004, I did that project. Then I felt, when I exhibited it in Delhi, I felt that you know, people are misunderstanding my context. Because why I am talking about all this religion in a in a in a in a point where I am critiquing the religion as a culprit for all these chaoses which is being created which historically is a true factor, but maybe they were not agreeing to that debate at that point of time because people wanted a departure from it. But I felt that I have to prove a point. Then I made a work, very consciously I made a work called My Father's Balcony, mm -hmm. which was part of the second you know, show in, uh, in, in Bombay, when I travelled my show from uh, Delhi to Bombay. I added that work in the Faith Akamani project because that's the you know that's the tension I felt. So you were always very you know I mean consciously like I mean, practicing dealing with these very sensitive sensitive subjects. So I wanted to bring that work, my father's balcony, into discourse to say that you know I'm doing these kind of projects because I have a background. In Right. That's our background. That's our history. Right. So that's then actually, to this brings us to the question of history, because I think the idea of uh, uh, the father's balcony actually brings together two moments. I mean, there is a, a whole history, uh, a weight of tradition, a, a set of practices that you inherit, uh, which are about sociability, which are about friendship which are about diversity, which are about conversation, but what you look out on from the balcony is a whole set of other things, of a changing set of circumstances, the conjuncture of religion, fault lines emerging in society. So you stand somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. carrying this history with you, but looking at a history in the making which you are very uncomfortable with. And that's why I was thinking about some of the uh, philosophy behind the setting up of the Kuchi Biennale, for example, because what struck me when I uh, came in 2012 for the first Biennale is that it was bringing together many submerged histories, both within the country, notions of equality, notions of friendship, which had been submerged in the emerging politics of the nation, but at the same time was also drawing upon larger international histories 
uh, arising from decolonization, you were thinking about a geography that included Iran as much as Vietnam, as much as uh, Yugosla the former Yugoslavia. So it was a different geography that was being put, which was also a different set of histories that was being put before people. The crucial thing about the Biennale, of course, was its location, right, in Aspenwall House, a site which had been trading for a considerable amount of period. As you entered the space, you could get the smell of pepper, jute, all the commodities that had passed through. You were very careful to have an artist uh, select and curate the procedures rather than having a curator. A lot of the artwork was created in situ. So there were many departures that the Cochin Biennale inaugurated, apart from the different history that it summoned up. Mm -hmm. So if you could just tell us briefly, why did you decide to do it? Because it was an act of temerity, or as in Malayalam, you would say changutam. Right? You know, to uh, think about generating a Biennale, you had been away from Kerala and Bombay for a while. Kerala is an extremely contentious space within which to do things. So why the Biennale, why in 2012, what were the ideas that went into it? Something along, something of those issues. I think, uh, as I said, I mean, you know, that uh, my, uh, from 92 onwards, I mean, if you really see that, I mean, you know, the kind of focus uh, uh, I've been, you know, having, in continuing a kind of discourse or you know, for a space that which is which accommodates uh, all kinds of possible conversations was was always there and I used to have you know many conversations with my friends uh, about the history of Kerala you know how less or how you know <clears throat> how much managed it is or how much packaged it is in a contemporary context to, 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 to easily, you know, uh, you know, establish a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a possible future. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I, I always used to have this kind of discourses. And I still remember in 99, uh, the, the second year of my master's uh, degree, I did a large installation uh, inside JJ School of Art called He Used to Believe That EMS Planted Coconut Tree in Kerala. Mm -hmm. So that was my, you know... EMS being EMS Nambudri yeah, yeah. Marxist theoretician, first chief minister of Kerala, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I used to always feel that, I mean, you know, there's a kind of a, you know, misconception that, I mean, you know, everything today, what you see is because of a certain kind of an ideology. Because, okay, I believe and I admire that you know we had a first you know 1957 we had the you know the demo first democratically elected communist government in the world i mean it's it's a remarkable uh, in achievement and the way we kept that you know history alive with you know great amount of social action and public participation distribution systems education transformation and but at the same time i still feel that we have forgotten many of our you know histories and contributions, I and mean, that was always there. So I started actually working on a project which uh, deals with the kind of a larger maritime history, and and uh, and I did a project. I mean, I did one work uh, which I which got exhibited called Saint Thomas at Fort Cochin in Amsterdam in 2010. That was one of my first work, which is going out of that uh, similar thinking. Then I was studying, you know, the cultural mix. Uh, of the place, and I started, you know, creating a lot of uh, uh, sculptures around that. It was the same time in 2010, you know, this particular possibility of conversation happens with the Culture Minister of Kerala. So again, the communist lineage, their interest in art and culture comes in, their interest in progressive thinking comes in from a Kerala perspective. So. It was a right junction that, I mean, you are also sitting on an idea to kind of propagate that secularism, idea of diversity, multiculturalism, coexistence, and Kochi is a site, you know, which you have identified to kind of tell the story of. So that's when this, you know, this minister asked, this Kami Baby, who was the culture minister and also the education minister of Kerala in 2010. So what, 
one can, what is possible to, to do in Kerala to kind of, you know, to, to, to bring this distance, to lessen the distance, you know, between this contemporary art and people and how we can, you know, transform in you know, a social space by also accommodating art. Because Kerala is famous for its literature, you know, its contributions in other areas of like, I mean, knowledge and cinema, you know, theater, you know, everything as you do. But visual art was always like, I mean, you know, he's, a, he's somebody who migrates, you know. Most of the visual artists, I mean, starting from Raja Radu Arma, have to kind of leave the state to survive. So there's a strong history of contemporary art also. Most of the important Malayali artists doesn't live in Kerala. They are so popular, but even Malayalis doesn't know. But it was not the case in the literature or in you know, uh, cinema, film. I mean, normally people lived in Kerala and practiced. But this was the junction. I mean, you know, but sharing that idea to kind of you know, do a binding, you know, to celebrate you know, the diversity of the larger nation in a place like Kochi where there are 40 different communities living together in a 4 kilometer square. Right. That was actually a kind of a very interesting trigger because that's what echoed, that's what resonated because what, you know, the power which you always felt about people was, you know, it's, 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 it's tremendous in the context of Kerala because if you have proper conversation there are people ready to listen to. So the issue which you pointed out, I mean, how difficult to enter into a place like Kerala with a new idea was equally challenged by having conversations, by telling the community there that this is a project which is going to celebrate your legacy. It is not a play project that which is going to kind of come and destroy that, you know, the indigenous, you know, uh, uh, you know qualities which this particular region has. It is already a cosmopolitan place. It has been in conversation with the larger world. It's got blood relations with the larger world. It's been a site where many kind of conversations reached, right. philosophies reached, religions reached. Many settlements happened through like um, trade and history. So I think within one year, that conversation, the debate was won, even before the binary was done. So it was an ongoing, like, I mean, 2011 was crucial in having this debate because it was a risk. It was not only a financial risk, I mean, uh, you know, the artists are taking, or the state felt that initially that, I, I, I think there's an important point one has to say in the context is that it was a coming together of a political will and an artistic vision and, and you know, a bureaucratic wisdom or an administrative wisdom. Well, you know, it was, it was discussed well. Okay, this can happen. And because these artists have taken or shown a courage to take risk. And the initial year, I mean, it was so difficult. I mean, after the first edition of the Biennium, the organization went into kind of a complete financial, you know, crisis. I mean, it was in a huge debt. And we had to fight a case to kind of, you know, to win. Uh, and get the money back and you know, stabilize it within another two years and by the second edition came. So for me that, you know, if any project, if it can root in the history of the place where it is happening, will grow. I think Kochi is a great example where, it, because it was celebrating their own history, their own legacy, their own, you know, and the responsibility of the Binale is even today and even from the beginning is to give back to them, you know, economically, you know, give, give them a little bit more of pride to celebrate, survive through that cultural economy which comes in, you know, slowly like it comes in and also flourish because Kochi is not a port city anymore, you know, the trade has gone into different modes, it is just a transit uh, port which is operated not even by the people of Kerala. It's, it's a completely different uh, you know, economic structure. So people have no hope because the ship is not reaching the shore. You know? So then, then what is the 
benefit you have. Mm. So, so Kochi's economy is not going to survive around these kind of trade possibilities. It will only survive through cultural economy, maybe a little bit of a tourism into it. So I think Kochi's history is a history which the, the, the larger world can celebrate. So, uh, from there. So it was a very interesting investment. I think it was maybe the best cultural acupuncture which happened in, in uh, post-independent India to, to reunite you know, this, you know, this, this, you know, uh, the fractures. Yeah, actually that's true. I mean, there's something about the politics of location or to borrow a phrase from where you are right now, the power of sight, yeah. that Kochi uh, summons up particular histories, uh, Kochi is located in particular histories, which is possibly what makes the Kochi Biennale also one of the most democratic Biennales. I mean, you pay a pittance of 100 rupees, you know, which is like the equivalent of 20 South African rands which means that everyone can go and in the four years that I've been going there have been auto rickshaw drivers, there have been the central reserve police force constables who have been yeah. recruited, there are people from madrasas, yeah. there are school children and they respond to a lot of these artworks with equal mixtures of bewilderment, understanding and knowledge. Yeah. So I think there's something that you've managed to do or the whole team around the Kochi Biennale have managed to do, which is possible perhaps only in Kochi, but I'd like to think it's a replicable model elsewhere, that through the Biennale, through such events, one is actually possible, it, it is possible for us to create a politics of friendship, to yeah. uh, bring back, to recover those histories where people live together amicably in conversation, in argumentation, as you put it. But finally, before we end the interview, I'd like to talk to you about your current project, Uru Harbor, mm. which is your own uh, uh, art practice center within at Fort Kochi, uh, which actually, and it's curious that you've chosen the word harbor, uh, because as you spoke right now, there is also, uh, there is a way in which maritime trade is a memory right now in Kerala. The sea is constantly present, but the sea as central to the economic life of Kerala is becoming less so, except through migration. Mm -hmm. That it's because of the ocean that Malayali see the Gulf yeah. as uh, another district of Kerala, for example. Yeah. So what does Uru mean to you? What do you hope to do with Uru? And if you could just speak a bit about why you chose that name, which is a very poignant and evocative name. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, Uru's, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of Uru actually started in 2014 with me after doing two editions of the Vinyan. So I was at a, you know, junction that I mean now I should move on and uh, think about a uh, little bit more about initial thoughts I had in 2010 when I, the, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, Kuchi was considered as a site of you know, celebrating the diversity. So, but some of my other readings that which I, which followed, uh, you know, even some of your observations about I mean, how the Malayali forgot the sea, you know, and he went behind the land, which was a colonial construct, in you know, a very different number, number than you made a very interesting observation around that. So, this has been there, and then some of the readings and uh, understandings. I think I still remember in the first you know, edition of the by name, uh, the essay which we wrote, you know, the, the project when me and Bose was, uh, uh, you know, the, the edition, first edition which was created by me and Bose, we did an essay and it was titled Salt Heels, yeah. you know, so and it, it, it actually had that, you know, uh, 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 assertion on, you know, why we are here, it is also because of the sea. You know, so there was that assertion, and in fact, the cover of the book, you know, if you notice that, I mean, it was the expanse of the sea and uh, the, what, the kind of exchanges, the kind of migrations which happen. So I am still in that mind frame. You know, I want to live that. You know, that's one reason that I thought, I mean, okay, the biennial every year will change its topic. It will break another story with a new curator. It will revolve around new subjectivities of the time, and it is a site to descend and we use that as also a kind of an expanse to kind of travel around. So the sea became a metaphor, you know, so that's 
one reason that I mean I got you should to carry this forward I mean you should have a very interesting you know center which can trigger these discourses so Uru was you know symbolically named I mean as you know as you know anybody associates with the you know uh, the sea and trade historically I think you know, Kerala has that a very interesting name to this Tao so decided that and slowly started looking at maritime history as a point to kind of discuss. So I think it's an ongoing project and I actually want to kind of focus very much on Uru and its initiative because I will never move away from this idea of you know the Kerala's maritime history and uh, which I also feel that I'm part of that kind of an historic narrative that where I feel that concerned about my own originality today you know, because you know, it's an, an ongoing process. It, this is also getting questioned, I mean, you know, what is your origin, I mean, as an individual, so whether are you also a migrant who reached here through, you know, yeah. different kind of trade travels which occur. So, I'm interested in that now, I mean, so I am, I want Uru to be a site of uh, dissent and discourse, and also to understand the history of human movement, mm. and how history has evolved, I mean, how much our region has, uh, you know, experienced, or, you know, and why Kerala is like that? I always ask that question. What is the special thing about this, you know, this Malayali? I mean, you know, what is this? Why he is like that? I mean, you know, and and geographically it is like that. I mean, you know, the Western Ghats, you know, the rivers flowing in to the sea. I mean, you know, we are almost like a, you know, a banana leaf, and uh, it's an amazing, you know, historic landscape. I mean, where we keep, you know, triggering that. You know, geographically, that discourse is very, you know, symbolic in that sense. I'm, as an artist, I'm, you know, I want that freedom to explore, travel, understand, do projects. So, what we did in, you know, the last, uh, you know, four months recently uh, was a great learning because we used chaos mills that. Uh, right. you know, the excellent that, series of photographs. Yeah, Manjuka, that seafarers of Malabar. It's a, it's a grant which Uru gave to chaos mill, and it's a travel research project. Then Biju's, you know, that Kochi's, you know, that 40 different community research project, which is an ongoing project. Yeah. Then also we showed, uh, you know, Joji's, that indigenous, that Lakshmi Kuniyama's portrait. But, but there was a great takeaway, I mean, for Uru, for all the people who are associated with Uru, I think, uh, which is going to be also kind of a slogan for us to kind of move on. I'm also even thinking about curating a project around that which is one of the seafarers from Bonani, while he was talking to K.R. Sunil in an interview, he said, Kadale, you know, uh, you know, Talakirna Champana. Hmm. So, sea is a boiling vessel. I mean, I don't think I mean, there's any other word, okay. you know, to, to to, to take away it as a learning for what you did for last 10 years in Cochin okay. and uh, you know and take that as a kind of a you know the largest okay. correspondence you know to take an institution which is also an offshoot of what I learned called Uru and I'm very serious about doing an exhibition uh, title that I mean see the boiling vessel I think that's a brilliant image on which to end, Kadalur Tadak in the Chambana, the idea of the sea as being the crucible of history, the sea of being the crucible of human endeavor. And as a historian, I'm deeply interested in your project of keeping history alive or keeping histories alive at a time when there is a mainstreaming of one narrative of Indian history. So thank you, Riaz, for the conversation. Thank you for coming to South Africa and doing this uh, superb installation, which I hope will spark off conversations across the ocean about equality, about friendship, and about history, about Gandhi, about Ambedkar, about Mandela, and the joint histories of apartheid and uh, caste both as yet unresolved histories. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks.